Welcome to Voice Rising with Cara Johnstad. Enjoy weekly conversations with leading luminaries, pioneering visionaries, singers, poets, musicians, and sound healers as we explore the profound role our voice plays on the path to self-realization and global enlightenment. The internationally acclaimed singer, composer, author, healer, recording artist, voice expert, creator of Voice Your Essence, and founder of the School of Voice, Kara Johnstad uses her extraordinary spiritual gifts to empower others. Everything in this world vibrates. Everything has a frequency. A pioneer in the field of voice work and transformational songwriting. Her breakthrough methods are helping thousands of people worldwide fine-tune their body-mind-spirit system and unlock the energetic frequencies of limitless creativity, health, and abundance. Share your voice. Ask your questions. Join in the conversation. Receive life-changing, positive transformation and rise together to create a sound world. And here's your host, Kara Johnstad. Hello, welcome to Voice Rising. Today I have with me in the studio Miss Judy Collins, a singer, songwriter, author, filmmaker, poet, record label head, musical mentor, social and environmental activist, a wise, deep soul. Her music has touched millions of hearts, and we are very lucky to have her with us today. Welcome, Judy, to Voice Rising. Thank you so much, Cara. How are you today? I am very good. I am very good. And I think you couldn't possibly know, unless you're telepathic, that your voice and your songs have guided me. I listened to you as a little girl standing in a cornflower blue bedroom in the middle of Wisconsin. And oh. as a young want to be singer, I packed two suitcases at the age of 19 put in letters to a young poet, um, Little Prince, and the Judy Collins songbook and my guitar. And huh? you are the reason, I think, that I trusted my voice and became a singer-songwriter. So I, I just want to start this interview before we deep dive into all these questions to give you a huge thank you. And I'm oh. sure I'm not the only one, I mean, that has not only been touched by your music, but has decided to trust in their own voice because of your your writing and because of your honesty and because of your, I guess, your authenticity and your resilience. I just, I feel very blessed to, to hang out with you today. So how's that? How's that? <laughs> well, that fills up a lot of exciting balloons and a lot of celebratory uh, fireworks <laughs> in my <Yeah>. head. <laughs> Yeah, right. Exactly. Judy, you are, one doesn't hear it in your voice, but you are 82 and you're celebrating, it says 60 years of music with two new albums this year. I think it might even be three because I, I know you're doing a town hall album release. So I, it might be two or three. You just launched a podcast. If everything relaxes, I'm sure you're going to be on tour. I did read somewhere that 120 concerts a year is still pretty normal for your, um, yeah, for, for your band and for you uh, to sing. But I know that you also played piano as a kid and were already given concerts with 13. So I think you basically, you spent your whole life in music and of music, right? I have, I have. That's Just the breathe. truth. Yeah, breathing, breathing in and out music. What projects are you currently excited about? Oh, so many. Now, I just started. Um, I'm at the finishing end of a new album that's going to be all my own songs. And so I'm quite excited about that. I've been writing a whole lot of songs since, well, all the, all the time, trying to write. And sometimes succeeding as we do, sometimes not. But I've got a whole batch of them that really happened to. They were hatched during the pandemic, and the name the name of the the name of the album will be Spellbound. But I was, I listened to it the other day all the way through. You know, most of the mix is close to being done. It's a real breakthrough for me because I've done 
um, I've written songs for years, but frankly, I've done song time. I've done an album, you know, recently a whole album of duets. I've done with the stories, which includes wonderful things. But I've never, I haven't had an album of my own material, really, except something called Cleaning Lessons. Maybe it was called that, or Voices, I can't remember. And um, then, which was a very small sort of production. And in 71, I think I made an album called Two Stories and Other Dreams. But that also included a couple of other songs by other people. So this is really a triumph for me, getting to this point. And it'll come out in 2022, which, you know, the way time flies, Cara, that's like yesterday. (laughs) That's right. That's beyond, that's beyond tomorrow and behind yesterday. It's right between. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you're, you were very famous. You still are famous as an interpreter for great songs. Yet, tell us the moment where you picked up the pen and started writing. Do you remember where you were when you started writing your first yes. song? I had, it was 1967. I had recorded, I had met Leonard Cohen. I'm just looking at a picture of us right now, singing together somewhere. And um, it's just heavenly divine. And he had, he had requested, uh, <laughs> he requested an audience with me in 1966 and he had started writing songs and he you know he didn't have everybody else in the village was writing their own songs except me so of course he couldn't go and sing his songs to Bob Dylan or to Eric Anderson or David Blue (laughs) Uh, so he came to see me because I'd already been recording for six years and I already had had aired and given given um, a new audience to a number of artists, including uh, including Pete Seeger, Woody Guthrie. Um, I don't think I'd recorded Farini yet, but Tom Paxton and mm-hmm. just an awful lot of a lot of artists. So he came to me and to my house, and he said, "I can't sing and I can't play the guitar, and I don't know if this is a song." And then he sang me Suzanne and two other songs. And I said, oh, my God, this is definitely a song. And I recorded Mm -hmm. Suzanne. And he called me a few days after that. And he said, um, or a few few weeks, actually, after after the song had come out on its record. And um, In My Life was the name of the album. And he said, you've made me famous. And I said, well, good, that's a wonderful piece of news. Good good for you, good for me. And he said, but I don't understand one thing. And in those days, uh, Leonard was never going to sing in public. He hated his voice. He thought he was an awful singer. He said, I wonder, I, I want you to be singing my, my songs. And, but the thing is, I don't understand why you're not writing your own songs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was the way he said it, it was the way, he, I mean, Dylan had always said to me, you should, you should, he used the word should, you should write your own song. And that's not what Leonard said. He said it was a question, why aren't mm-hmm. you writing your own song? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's the then uh, posing of a problem, of a question in a very different way. It's not, it doesn't assume judgment about you. <laughs> you know what isn't I mean? That, yeah, isn't that fascinating? <laughs> right? One it's says a, should, and you feel kind of put into a corner, maybe, and the other one says, "I'm curious why yeah, you don't share curious. your heart, or why I'm curious." Yeah, why show you your why. Yeah. yeah, and I ran. I came running home to my Steinway piano, and I sat down and I wrote since you asked. It took me about forty minutes. But of course, that's the way they get you. You know, <laughs> it takes forty minutes, then the next one takes five years. <laughs> <laughs> Was it very different? For, were you when you were studying piano? Were you also improvising, or or were you really just studying Rachmaninoff or Chopin or Mozart? Were you used to composing like that? No, no, not really. Although. Although I could, and yeah. I remember Dr. Rico saying to me, I hate that jazz, I don't want you to be improvising. I could, if called upon, I could 
make up anything or re- respond to somebody's question, do you know such and such a song? But I mean, it was a natural thing with me because I did play all the time. I practiced. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd yeah. be on my father's radio show. I'd be on the school show. But no, I never tried to write anything. And it's a good, it's interesting because nobody ever asked me to do it. Nobody ever said, why aren't you? Or, gee, you could try this and, you know, see how it goes. Right. No, right. It never, that never occurred. And I'm not, in those days, I'm not sure about the music classes or even the studying with Brico. Well, Brico was very much against anything that wasn't Beethoven or Chopin or Rachmaninoff. I mean, she she was very friendly with um, um, the uh, many of the current people who were composing at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, I know that one of the big composers that she knew had some daughters. And when the composer died, the daughters burned all of his un finished manuscripts because they didn't oh, believe that goodness. Sibelius, Sibelius's daughters, yeah. and they didn't think that anything should be out of his that wasn't finished, so they, I don't know, they had their own point of view about it, yeah. but yeah. Brico was a stickler for you, you didn't want to be, to do something badly <laughs> that somebody else yeah. had done well, yeah. you know, yeah. so she wouldn't have given any encouragement all those years, but all yeah. he had to, of course, I have such... I am so privileged that I got to know Leonard because he was, well, he was like a Zen master anyway. He was a meditating monk and he, he just, he was, he was, um, uh, stilled, stilled, what is the word? He was, um, he lived in the, in the, in the, the words of the Koran, not the Koran, of the of the Bible, and so mm-hmm. he was, you know, his family was uh, was very traditional um, Jewish family, and temple meant everything in the world to him. Mm-hmm. And so he had this deep, deep, deep philosophy and understanding about life and art and everything. He was just enormously uh, developed soul, <laughs> and I was privilege to get to spend time with him. So since you asked was not your first song, but it was your first song recorded, I believe. Oh, it was my first song. Oh, yeah, it's the first first song song I ever wrote. You yeah. just in forty minutes. Look at you go! Wow, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's you hear. I mean, you do hear this this poetry. I don't know what for came first, the melody or the words, or if they all came rushing at you all together. Um, yeah. But let's. Do you want to listen to it? I'd love. Oh the, sure, I'd yeah. like to. I'd like. Yeah, to. I'd I'd love the audience to hear it. So let's listen to Good. since you've asked. Okay. Uh, originally from Wildflowers, right? The album yeah. 67. Right. Yeah. What I give you since you've asked is all my time together. Sunny days, the warm and rocky weather. Take the roads that I have walked along, looking for tomorrow's time. Peace of Spills into yours, changing with the hours, filling up the world with time, turning time to flowers. I can show you all the songs that I never sang to one man before. We have seen a million. Stones lying by the water. You have climbed the hills with me to. 
to the mountain shelter of childhood All the willow winding paths leading up and outward This is what I give This is what I ask you for Nothing That was Since You Asked by Judy Collins, who's with me here in studio today. Judy, a quick question. Do you normally uh, compose at the piano, or do you like composing at the guitar, or is it both? It's not both. It's only the piano. But lately, and over the course of time, you know, things change a little bit, and I've, I've grown a lot of writing first and then going to the piano and seeing whether the song emerges or whether I turn it into a poem. And uh, that seems to work very well right now. It's, uh, you know, I used to always have to be sitting down at the piano noodling and out of the air comes something or other. Or if I'm, if I'm doing it, it's like a guided meditation. For instance, um, I wrote a song for the commander, the first woman commander of a space shuttle. Her name is Eileen Collins, and she's just come out with a book called um, uh, The Glass Ceiling the Glass Ceiling, uh, and Flying Through the Universe, or something like that. Anyway, mm-hmm. it's Eileen Collins' uh, book, new book, and it is featuring the song that I, in in the prose somewhere, or the lyrics to the song that I wrote for her, Beyond the Sky, is what it's called. I got commissioned by NASA to write that song. So I sat down with some newspaper articles about Eileen Collins and how she had, as a child, begun to think about flying and convinced herself that she could join the Air Force and be, be a pilot. Uh, that was not really possible. People said it wasn't possible. But like many of my her- heroes and heroines, she did something <clears throat> that people said shouldn't be able to be done. I always like to run, run into people like that because they're very inspiring. So I did, I did ponder a bit of the background for her life. But then I just sat down and wrote... Um, once there was a girl with a dream in her heart, wild as the wind, was her hopes. And so it just flowed right out from there. Sometimes that happens. But the songwriting, the mysterious songwriting that comes about. Yesterday, I was listening to the songs, to some songs of Dave Carter. He's the one who wrote a song called When I Go, which I did as a duet with Willie Nelson in my duets album a couple of years ago. It's one of the great songs. And so I'm listening to Dave Carter, other songs, not that one. And uh, Kelly, uh, his his part, his writing partner. And I just got this flash when I put down a few lines. And by golly, I think I've got a new song that's, it may be this week's highlight. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, Judy. We're going to take a very short break and be back in a few moments with more about music and songwriting and voice. The cutting edge of conscious radio, Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. 
a philanthropic organisation, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Connect at ohmtimes.com. Ohm Times, creating a more conscious lifestyle. With happy clients all over the world, Kara Johnstad knows that your voice is the missing link to more authenticity, abundance, creativity, and health. An internationally acclaimed voice expert, Kara's breakthrough methods have helped thousands of people successfully heal their voice wounds and extinguish the story of self-doubt and shyness forever. Join in group trainings, attend online sessions, schedule one-on-one -on -one time, and invite Kara to work with your organization and community. Get started today. Go to www.karajohnstad.com and receive a special guided meditation designed to fine-tune your inner voice and welcome you on the voice journey. This is Kathy Beal, host of Celestial Compass, featuring astrology you can use. Celestial Compass points you to what's going on in the sky and what you can do with it down here on Earth. We also explore fun, effective, and cosmic tools for navigating this adventure we call life. Join me the first and third Monday of the month at 5 p.m. Eastern Time for Celestial Compass. It's enlightening, entertaining, and empowering. Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. Welcome back to Voice Rising. I am your host, Cara Johnstad, and with me in studio is Judy Collins. Judy, when you started your career, it was a time of tremendous hope and of tremendous innocence, a pivotal period, and people were marching in the streets against war, and there was a huge uh, surge in songwriting it was a mixture of disenchantment and romantic idealism. If we fast forward to today, I believe we also have this feeling of disenchantment and skepticism and a drive to fight for justice. And yet, I also see that many people are missing that romantic idealism and they feel simply exhausted. Um, as a lifelong social activist, and someone whose voice shaped the 60s and continues to be a voice that is shaping our world. What is your take on where we are as a country and globally, and what causes are important to you now? I, I want to just repeat in proper sequence the name of this book about Eileen Collins, Colonel yes. Eileen Collins. It's called Through the Glass Ceiling to the Stars. And I admire this woman so much as uh, Colonel Eileen Collins, USA, has retired. And, uh, you know, she she had a dream, and everybody said, no, you can't. And my teacher, Dr. Rico, had a dream of becoming a conductor, and people said, no, you can't, because you're a woman. My father, who was blind after the age of four, had a dream and decided that he was going to become a performer, which he did. And people say, well, you, you know, you can't do that. You're blind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he really is a person who saw more clearly than most of the people I knew who were sighted. Um, I was born an optimist. So that gives you both disappointment and also inspiration and in how to get through the day. I think it comes in the DNA because a lot of, the times when we look around the world and think, how can this possibly be? How can anything change this? I, I believe in spiritual connections and in yes. in meditation and in a positive attitude and in knowing that if I have a thought, you know, Christian Murder or somebody, Christian Murder, 
maybe it was uh, Yogananda, somebody said, if you have the thought about it, then you will be given the directions as to how to get there. Mm-hmm. And I really believe in it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in mystical experience and in powerful transformations that have nothing to do with what's in front of the nose and everything to do with things we cannot see. So I, I, yes, there have been terrible times. It was a time of optimism. It was also that horrible war going on, the Vietnam War, which I think is yes. we are still paying for. It was a disaster. It was a, a catastrophe. And we, you know, you know, we think, as being human beings, we think that we can get a little, okay, done and dusted, goodbye, that's enough. It's never enough. There's always resonance of things that are damaged. So it was a kind of a kind of a national disgrace and trauma, which we're trying, I think, unconsciously, to get over. I really believe that. Also, I believe that the next day the sun comes up, and there's a great lesson in that because that means okay, I do the things that I do. I take care of what's in front of me, I eat well, I exercise, I do some meditation, I do some writing, I do some practicing. And these are the things that hold me to my goals and my aspirations, which are, can I finish that song that was started yesterday by an inspiring voice from the past, from Dave, Dave Carter? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe it is that simple if each and every one of us did that eating consciously, doing some exercise, bringing beauty and truth to the world, right? Um, sharing our voice in uplifting and positive ways and not being uh, constantly condemning or critical. I mean, if each one took care of their own little corner of the world, yeah. then the planet would be okay. I, I remember my sister, who's a Buddhist nun, she... Um, she actually said that to me once when I was getting really frazzled about, you know, climate change and, and the, the whole world. I was I was doing the whole world and she taking said, it uh, on. And she said, <laughs> Cara, yeah, she said, Cara, just <laughs> take your corner of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Do what you can in your corner. And if everybody exactly. does that exactly. and it was a it was a great lesson, actually. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, um, you know, we we are able to dream big. My father was actually in the astronaut program. Uh, uh, also, oh. He actually flew planes before he could even drive a car because <laughs> coming, yeah, coming from a small town in Wisconsin with parents that had uh, divorced in that time, right? I mean, I think yeah. in the 40s and, and 50s he wanted to fly away and so he yeah. flew as a fighter pilot in the astronaut program and everything else so i think we we can we can move mountains in many ways yeah. right with our yes, voice yes we can yeah yeah, yeah. um let's and it doesn't the... it doesn't mean that we cannot look back at what was there i'm looking at a drawing of Dream Lake in Colorado, and uh, the little mountain they called it, and this incredible little drawing that my brother Denver gave me. You know, there, you know, I could burst into tears and sob and weep over the lost paradise. I, I could do that, yeah. and there are moments yeah. when I do internally. I, I think these things have to be mourned. The passing of the time of hope has to be mourned. But the celebration of the moment of doing the little things, carrying wood, chopping wood, carrying water, being, being um, responsible to the next uh, act- activity that's required of you, the discipline in that is, is phenomenal. And out of that comes, I think, something magical, myst- mystical, which we don't we don't know where it comes from. I remember Dylan always saying in, in his Chronicle One, the book that he wrote about songwriting, about his life, he said, I don't know how, I don't know why it started, the songwriting, that 10 years. I don't know where it came from. I have no idea. I've yeah. been, been uh, thinking that I could tell him where it came from, <laughs> yeah. which, which is that I knew he started sleeping in people's houses that had really good libraries. 
But, <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> we don't know where it comes from. So we have to take care. Also, we have to be careful in getting rid of our demons that yeah. we don't kill off the one that's inspiring us um, accidentally. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I think that with all this shining light, light, and shooting for only the positivity, we forget that the trees are anchored in rich dirt and darkness, right? We, yeah. We, yeah. we somehow forget that part of the equation as we strive for perfectionism and excellence, that there's a lot of withering leaves. And, I mean, let's bridge into this amazing song you did called the Pharaoh way, which is a lot about, you know, the, the, I mean, Pharaoh, as we know, is that period where something is left so it can uh, create something new so it can restore its fertility. You, you brought out this, uh, you're such an inspiration for me. I tell you, I'm, I'm 56, but I tell you, I'm like 2019, (laughs) you scored your first number one album on the American billboard chart with winter stories, right? You were 80, right? And you are <laughs> flying collaboration yeah. with the Norwegian singer Jonas, um, does he say Fjeld? Jonas Fjeld, yes. And the Blue Bla- uh, Bluegrass Band. And Chatham, the Chatham, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, County Chatham Line. Chatham County Line. Yeah. So that's a little bit like where does inspiration come from? I mean, was this last year for you in I'm, I'm sure New York had a lot of lockdown. Also, we had seven months of lockdown this yeah. year and four months last year. Yeah. Did you really, did you feel that it gave you time to integrate and reflect and slow down and, and actually feed your muse and your creativity? Absolutely. I was, um, we were home, of course, in New York and um, couldn't, didn't, fly, didn't walk, didn't travel, basically. We walked around the park and the riverside, and uh, we ate three meals a day, and we uh, had time, and we slept. That was a change. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And all these horrible things that happened, all these deaths, I appreciate the loss. I appreciate it, and I did my prayers and tried to be conscious of the powers around me, and also the failings around me. But that's life. And I, re- I read a lot of Marcus Aurelius just because he, li- he, was, he died in a pandemic in 106 AD. Uh, it was called the, a- the Apennine, Apennine, Apennine uh, uh, Pandemic. Mm-hmm. Is that right? I think so. But he, he was, of course, a... Um, a meditator and a practical person. So the sto the stoicism that he writes about is very attractive to me. Very attractive. I think a stoic meaning you take it as it comes. Mm-hmm. You play it as it lays. <laughs> you pray and you and you I guess we become grateful how precious each breath is and how precious our life is, right? Because we yeah, the truth is we exactly. don't know. We don't know. It's in the moment it's a pandemic, but it could be a car crash. I mean, we really don't know. Um, let's listen to Fall Away. Unless you want to say a few Good. words before, I would just say let's listen to this gorgeous song off of your album, Winter Stories, and then we can talk a little bit more afterwards. Oh, good. That sounds divine. Thank you. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> Crackling flames 
hills when silver stars are high and still deep in the velvet of the sky the crystal time the silent times i learned to love their quietness while deep beneath the glistening snow the black earth dreams of Conscious lifestyle to your world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com Life is a flow, and enlightenment is simply harmonizing with the way life really is. Then you find that life is effortless, benevolent, and free of all suffering. Hey everyone, this is G.P. Walsh, and I want to invite you to my brand new radio show that's launching right here on Home Times Radio called The Flow of Enlightenment. I've been a spiritual teacher for decades, and my greatest pleasure is being able to share with you these deep and highly practical spiritual ideas. So join me in The Flow every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, and let yourself be transformed. The United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. At the Equal Justice Initiative, we believe mass incarceration has to end. There is this presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people. We have to confront our history of racial injustice and commit to a new era of truth. There's something better waiting for us, something that feels more like freedom. 
truth can inspire change. Please learn more at EJI.org. Welcome back to Voice Rising. I am your host, Cara Johnstad, and with me in studio is Judy Collins. And we were listening to The Fallow Way off of Winter Stories before we headed into the break. Um, Judy, this is a direct uh, question from our listening audience. They ask you, um, at a certain age, we believe that the vocal cords stiffen and slow and the high notes all dry up and our voice tends to lower in pitch. And many of your contemporaries have bowed out of recording new material, yet you continue to thrive. Your voice is stronger than ever. How do you do it? Are there any vocal tips for the people that are not only young, but are 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, that we could <laughs> learn from you? What's your secret? Well, I can pass along to you what I was told by my teacher. I found him in 1960 when I was losing my voice because I didn't know anything about singing. I knew how to play piano. I'd studied for years. And I'd sung in choirs and choruses and was, you know, I sounded fine. But then I would lose my voice after the strain of a tour and so on. And I went to see, I called two friends. I called Harry Belafonte's pianist, a really guitarist, mm -hmm. who gave me a name. And I called a couple who ran the uh, Lenox, Massachusetts uh, arts, arts school. And... Um, I, they gave me the same name, and I called this guy. I had a phone number, and he, I said, I've been given your name. I'm told that you're the best, and he demurred. And I said, I'd like to come and see you. And he said, well, tell me, what, do you, what kind of music do you sing? And I told him, he said, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> I said, I, I have to see you. You're the one that they said is going to help me. And he said, well, maybe. You, you, why don't you come over? And I said, okay, where do you live? And I walked out my front door on the eighth floor of 845, uh, of 179 West, 164 West 79th, and I walked out my door and turned right and passed in front of the elevator and rang his bell. Now, that doesn't tell you anything about singing, but it tells you something about destiny, and I studied mm. with him for 22 years. He was the guy. He knew what to do. And when he was dying, he said to me, don't worry. Just do what I told you, and don't forget the two most important things in your voice are clarity and phrasing. Mm. And I can tell you, yes, there's, there's a way to... It has to do with clarity. If you mm -hmm. can understand the words, you're singing well. If you can't, you're not. If you develop a wobble in your voice, go see somebody right away. Mm -hmm. It is not true that all voices deteriorate. It's simply not true. It's the, the wrong, you're singing the wrong way. Now, it's not complicated. I mean, there's nothing wooly wooly about it. You don't sing from your head or your neck or your chest or anything else. You do what comes naturally. You know, we were given this voice to be able to scream our lungs out in the in the jungle while we ran after some creature that we were supposed to kill and eat for dinner. So that voice is meant to do hard duty. Yes. And it doesn't yes. it doesn't mean that you scream when you sing, it means that you focus on the lyric and what does it mean and is it clear and the phrasing is clear. Yes. I quite often suggest that people read what it is that they're singing. Read it out loud and make it as clear as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I was lucky. So, you know, I studied with a man who, who knew that, who told me that I could sing until I fell over. Yeah. And I believed him. Yeah. And I did what he told me. And I'm a very resistant little girl. So I didn't want to do what he told me all the time, but I did. Yeah. Thank the God. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, and the clarity comes too from what you're saying is also listening, so not pushing and not not pressing because that that is no. the lower vocal folds. So there's a 
a thing in the in the music biz called those vocal edges and the clarity the voice is able to regenerate itself 24 7 if we yeah. take care of it exactly yeah yeah, yeah. judy it's judy, a I wanna, build. yeah it's i want to play one last forever. it's built to last forever um i want to play one last song for everybody yeah. because our conversations are so so beautiful and the music is so beautiful it's hard to know what to do but i do want to <laughs> play for them open the door and oh. um, let's let's do open the door it's all about friendship as far as i can yes tell. it is yes a yes, lot about friendship exactly so yeah. let's listen to inter open the door yeah. to you as you are to me when i see you happy judy it sets my heart free i swear i swear um <laughs> you know the, the music business can be tough i mean life can be tough but the music business is is kind of hard because you're out there on stage and very vulnerable maybe also very loved by the audience but talk to us a little bit about friendship and and the 
the importance of knowing that there are people where you can just absolutely let go and be yourself. Yes, yeah, friendship so important. And of course, looking back, as you get to be of an age, you know, I remember friends of mine, say, older friends of mine saying, you know, everybody's gone, everybody's gone. Yeah. And I must say, uh, a lot of people are gone. A lot of people yeah. are gone. I think, and deep friendships, of course, the the resonance of a deep friendship is always with you. And it yeah. carries over after life has ceased. It carries over because it's part of your, anyway, the furniture of your unconscious and the yeah. presence of your friends whom you've loved and treasured and had wonderful experiences with. I believe in conversation between people. I think things happen that are unexpected and divine and and powerful within the the conversation of good friends, old friends, new friends. And you know, we have my husband and I have we, we have a very strong social life in, in New York City. We have a lot of people that we spend time with and as during the pandemic, we just switched switched over to Zoom and mm-hmm. continued to have, when we would have been having a dinner at some restaurant in the city, we switched off to having a Zoom conversation. And, you know, it's been very healing, very rich, very good. And now we're starting to go back to restaurants, which is, is another wonderful way of sharing with people. Having a meal with someone is always very revealing and different and it puts you on a different plane with people and the more you see them the deeper your your conversations go and so i think that there's an enrichment in friendship that cannot be measured by any means except that you're there you're participating and your mind is being challenged and stretching and being amused we need to be amused yeah there's that word again, muse, and, and to be amused, and, and I always ah, love to play, like, right? <laughs> to be amused yeah. with the muse. And conversation <laughs> yes. also has the word verse. I mean, for us yeah. that are poets, universe, and conversation. Right, so, right, and right. I, I don't know if you know this quote, Judy, but I, I remembered it when I was preparing for the interview, and it was on a... It's on a headstone in the Green River Cemetery in Springs, New York. And it says, and and I just, I I love this quote, and I thought I'd share it with you. Artists and poets are the raw nerve endings. No, let me say it properly. Artists and poets are the raw nerve ends of humanity. By themselves, they can do little to save humanity. Without them, there would be little worth saving. Oh, do you know that? That's beautiful. It's anonymous, so it's it's inscribed in a, on a on a tombstone where in a cemetery where Jackson Pollock is lying, and there are many oh. artists there. But I I think it's so beautiful that the artists are these raw nerve endings. So we're feeling we're feeling our environment, and we can't save the world by ourselves. But without us, there's. I mean, I guess the the incredible nature is to be saved. But, you know, when we all go, nobody's looking at their bank statements. They're, they're all listening to the music. They're listening to yeah. the music. They're reading the poetry. They're, they're, they're loving the voices of the past that continue to be in the present and go into the future. Which oh, just, yeah. Right? oh, yeah. Right? I mean, it's just yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. Um, if you had a little golden nugget, you live all layers of voice. I mean, you literally go from the inner voice work to to the singing, to the writing. You have over, I think, nine books. You're writing a book of poetry. Um, oh, yeah. You've, yeah. you've done a film. <laughs> so every single layer of voice is there. I think people don't realize how rich our voice is. What is the golden nugget that you would like people to know about voice? What it gives them? Oh, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. You can shout in the woods. You can whisper to bring things to a point. You can smoothly travail, traverse a story which is a hard story to tell, 
which may cause people to weep. But once you get through understanding the story, it won't cause you to weep while you sing. Weeping while you sing is not it's not an effective way to get the point across. Mm-hmm. So the first thing you have to do is uh, more from your sorrow into the ability to sing it without weeping. And uh, then you give the chance to other people to weep or laugh and or both. Mm. And it's a great path to reach other people because it also contains in the voice, in the singing voice, it contains memory. That's how a lot of animals communicate. Whales certainly, first on the list, their singing is communicating information. And I think that when we sing, we stimulate one another's memories. Certainly, it's been discovered that people who have dementia and who cannot speak or sing can understand when music happens. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Judy Collins, thank you so much for being with me today. I wish you much success. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Continued success for everything you do. You're a great inspiration to us all. Thank you, Tara. I'm so glad we talked today. I send you love and healing and joy and rainbows. Woohoo! Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs>